My name is Stanley Hainsworth. I'm going to talk a little bit about storytelling and uh, do it through kind of my little life path, and you'll see what I mean. Um, so whether you're um, going through the gazillions of web pages that are out there or you're shopping in a, in a big box grocery store like this, I mean, all of us have the experiences where we're walking through, we're, we're waiting for something to call out to us, you know, something that, that has some meaning or something that's familiar, and, and in this big morass of, of uh, consumer products and goods and services and experience, it's a lot like trying to uh, wade through a, a big mass of people. And, and, and you look through those people, you, you're looking, let's say you didn't know anybody. You're looking for somebody that has a smile um, that, that might um, uh, catch your eye. So consumers are, are, brands are like people as well. Um, all those things that are sitting on the shelf or are sitting on websites, um, those are all uh, things that are, are waiting for us uh, to reach out and, and touch them. And, and, you know, the first encounter with a brand is, is usually something that, you know, you, you try it out. You, you take it home with you or you, you have your first experience with that brand and you decide you like it. So you go for a second date and you try that out. And then if it's, if it's worthwhile, then you, you might develop a long-lasting relationship with that uh, with that that brand, and you know, I was in uh, New York over the weekend, and I was, and I was looking at, you know, I get a lot of people look at me and take pictures, so I, I figured it's a fair game. Um, so I was on the subway, and I was uh, looking at some of these people, and I was just thinking, it's like, it'd be so great to know what their stories were. It's almost like if you could, if you could see people, and they kind of had their stories as a little hologram s sitting in front of them, so you. Yeah, all of a sudden, they they're, they're go from being a generic person to having this interesting background and, and their history and their, their hopes and dreams. Um, so the only guy I could get to talk to me was this guy. Um, so just quick story of this person. So you, you, know, you see me on the stage, and you know, you're, all you know is what you see. So just quickly, uh, I grew up in a little town between Possum Trot and Monkey's Eyebrow in western Kentucky. And I grew up a fairly normal boy. But I knew that uh, eventually I might uh, inherit my father's hairstyle, or at least his hairline. And um, so over the years, I, uh, you know, I, I tried a lot of different things. And I, you know, I, I, I went with what I knew. You know, I, for a long time, I was a big David Bowie fan. So I looked like uh, the Aladdin Sane cover for a while. And, and then um, as, I, as I grew up, I decided, well, I had to decide what I wanted to be for uh, when I got big. And so I decided, what I really wanted to be was an actor. So I, I moved to LA and I got my first acting job at a restaurant waiting tables, Hamburger Hamlet on Sunset and Doheny. And I waited on all the stars. And then eventually I started getting work and then I moved to New York and I, and I uh, started playing guitar in the subways and eventually started playing in clubs. And, and then I wrote books and made movies. And, and, uh, and it was when I really reached my pinnacle of my career when I found out I have a a bacon number of three, um, that I decided that I could give up that career and, and do something else. And so actually, uh, you know, when you see a person, you know, they're really, they're behind them or within them are all these layers of all the people that they've been and all the aspirations that they have as well. And, and that's really what, uh, it's really what a brand's about. Um, just a quick uh, visual demonstration. Um, here's a blanket right here. So this blanket right here is, uh, you look at it and you, you say, you know, I, if I ask you what's the value of this blanket, you know, you might look at it and go, I don't know, what, a hundred bucks or something like that? And then if I tell you, let me put it around my shoulders for dramatic effect. Um, if, uh, if I uh, tell you the story about this, how it was started by John Grace, who was a Boston lawyer. He gave up his career and he went back to RISD to learn how to hand loom blankets. And, uh, and all the, the sheep were on Swan's Island off the mid-coast of Maine, and they were hardy sheep because of the cold, and they ate, they ate the, the, the sea moss that was there. And everything there is hand-loomed and hand-dyed with organic dyes. So here are some of the pictures from the operation there. And uh, everything, you know, it's the, from the indigo, the, the flower, and you have to dip it in and out several times to get the oxidation, which turns it to that deep blue color, to the cochineal, which is a, a beetle. And that is, uh, you know, found in uh, Mexico and Central America. And so all this work to hand loom a blanket 
You know, every, every, uh, every thread is hand done. So once, you, once I go through all that for you, and then I hold that up, so now you know the history of the blanket. So now I can ascribe a different value to this blanket because of the, of the story that it has behind it. And they go for about $500, these throws here. Um, so after my acting career, I, um, I kind of fell into the, the, the world of design. I had no training besides acting, um, but um, Nike was uh, kind enough to take me on. They thought it'd be interesting. I had an eclectic background. And so when I started working for Nike, I thought it was a shoe company. And then I you know, found out the history and the, the passion of the founders of the company. I was a kid of the 50s. Played baseball, basketball, ran track. I wrote about sports for the Cleveland High Blotter. I hated the Yankees because they always won. And I wore Converse sneakers. I went to Oregon to run for Bill Bowerman. He was part genius, part madman. And he was the best coach I ever had. I got my first pair of real track shoes my freshman year, Adidas, three stripes. I kept them in my room on their own shelf under a spotlight. I loved those shoes. After college, I went to business school. They told us to write a thesis about what we knew. I knew a lot about track and a little about sneakers. So when the rest of America was worried about missiles in Cuba, I was writing about making shoes in Japan. I worked for an accounting firm. Then Kennedy was assassinated and a whole generation of us began to think, what's the point? When you're working with debits and credits, it's easy to think, what's the point? I guess for me, the point was track shoes. Six months later, our first shipment arrived from Japan. For a couple of years, I led a double life, counting beans by day, selling shoes by night. My father said, when are you gonna quit fooling around with those shoes and concentrate on your real job? So I quit my real job and began fooling around with the shoes full time. In 1972, we launched the Nike brand for real at the Olympic trials in Eugene. Back then, marketing meant a couple pairs of shoes and some free t-shirts. There were about 100 marathoners at the trials. We signed up four pretty good ones. They finished fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh. Our first poster. I went to school, got married, had kids, worked for a living. And until I realized that Bill Barman's waffle iron was for real, I had never done a crazy thing in my life. So for Nike, the, the, the what really was the shoes, but, but the why is the, the uh, innovation and inspiration. And that's what, um, it's, it's like a person, the, the things that I showed you about me, the, the, the way that I look is the what, but all my experiences and everything behind it is the why. So when, when I was at Nike, we used to, one thing I learned too is that you always learn from your, from your consumer, people that use your product or use your experiences. And um, at Nike, we saw that there were these sneaker freaks who would take shoes and then they would start decorating on their, their own. They would, they'd cut off parts of one and put it on the other and they'd take markers out. And so from that came the idea for, for Nike ID. So through the, all the uh, experiences of, of Nike, it, it, it has moved beyond being a shoe company to, um, to being about uh, innovation and inspiration. And then I went to Lego. And Lego's uh, located in Denmark, tiny little town where there's pretty much cows and bricks. That's all that's there. And, um, but I also thought Lego was about the brick. But I got there and I found out the history of Lego. It was started by Ole Christiansen, who was a wooden toy maker who had this idea for the automatic binding brick. And Lego, as you know, if you take a couple uh, bricks and you add another 10 to it, you end up with uh, millions of combinations. So Lego isn't about a brick or about a toy, it's about endless imagination. And 
and I learned that as we as I watched um, uh, the consumers interact with the brand and built the brand, and you saw what um, uh, brand fans would do with Lego. And, and so with Lego, is that the, one of the most fun uh, projects there was, was do, uh, designing the retail stores. And there's, there's uh, examples of them throughout the world now. There's one in uh, Bell Square here in Bellevue. But I thought the, the interesting challenge was to base that whole store around a brick. So because that one brick stood for that endless imagination. And so the interior of the store, that yellow part there, that's the play area where you could play with anything that's in the store. And everything in the store is a bigger or smaller version of that little two by four brick. And then taking, taking the uh, back wall where before you had to buy, in order to get 5,000 black bricks, you had to buy all these different sets that had all a bunch of different other things in them. And so we, we designed the pick a brick area where you could buy it by bulk. And so that people like, um, usually they're 30-year-old uh, males, they, they wanted to buy, build a, a computer or a fully functioning air carrier air conditioner out of Lego bricks, or a harpsichord, or 10,000 Lego pieces to build Han Solo and Carbonite masterpiece. <laughs> and then, and then uh, the most valuable real estate in the store was taken up by that white um, ribbon there. We called it the brand ribbon. And that area there, that was to not sell any products, but it was to, to talk about the story of the brand. And so it's, it was set at a five or six year old um, child's height. And so they were able to look through there and see all these fun little stories about the brand and interact with the brand. And, and for adults to interact with the brand, they had to bend over. And this is how we said it back then, as, uh, to touch the child within. They had to bend over, touch the child within. Um, uh, <laughs> Well, you know how when you join a brand, it's like joining a religion, right? It's like, you know, you, you learn all the tenets of the religion, and as communicators of that brand, you know, we're, we're there to get converts, and it, it was wonderful, but you have to get somewhat brainwashed in, in those brands. So, in the same way that we, we saw uh, Nike with the, what, what uh, brand fans were doing with the shoes, same way at Lego. So everywhere I went, someone, when someone, some kid found out that I worked at Lego, oh, you know, it's my dream to become a master builder and build those dinosaurs in Legoland. They all wanted to be Lego designers. So it's like, how can we, how can we let them participate more in the brand? And finally, technology uh, caught up with us, and we're able to um, go to Lego Digital Designer, and you can create anything you want um, digitally. And uh, I roughly built this car, and it cost me sixteen forty nine. And then it says, Do you, "Would you like to customize the packaging?" Yes, and you can have that customized, your one of a kind creation with customized packaging sent to your home. And then you can also post it to the gallery, so you can show your friends what you created, and your friends or other people can buy that creation as well. So uh, amazing participation in the brand by by the brand fans. And then I returned to the uh, Northwest um, to, um, to work for Starbucks. And I, I was in Portland, then Denmark, and then uh, Seattle. O only Seattle audiences get this joke, but uh, it's, um, you know, when I moved back here, I decided to adopt a hairstyle that would celebrate the great Northwest. So I have the, uh, uh, the, the clear cut and the old growth. That's it. <laughs> and so when I started at Starbucks, I... Um, I, I thought Starbucks was a coffee company. Oh, you would think that, wouldn't you? It's star it was, at the time, Starbucks coffee company. And then the history of Starbucks, everyone knows. Um, and I went to Central America, and I, uh, and I, I observed the coffee farmers, how they, how they grew and tended the coffee, and how they dried it, and how they roasted it, and just all the uh, love that they put into that product. And I, and I thought I knew what um, Starbucks was about. But it wasn't until I... 
I went to, I worked, when you, when you start there, you get to work inside a store for a week. And so I, I, I went to work in, inside my local Starbucks. And um, it was confusing for my neighbors because they were like, they said, because I just moved there from Denmark. They said, where do you work? I said, Starbucks. And they go, oh, cool. So they walked in Starbucks and I was there cleaning the tables and, you know, taking out the trash. And they go, oh. Starbucks, okay. Um, but that was great about Starbucks is that everyone's called a partner, everyone's equal. It doesn't matter if you're Mr. VP of design or if you're a barista, everyone's treated the same and that was a great lesson for me. But when I was in the back room, um, they had these uh, yellow sheets of paper and it, and it said, uh, Susie, cute little pink purse, tall non-fat latte. And I said, what's that? And they said, oh, that's our 100 club. We've all vowed to memorize 100 customers and their names. I said. Wow, that's amazing. And so I went back there a few months later and I said, where's your, you know, where's your 100 club? And they pointed over there. It was now the 200 club because they'd all done that. So that's when I realized what Starbucks really wasn't a coffee company. Um, it was, uh, it, it was uh, more about the community and, and someone who knows you by name. And so um, the brand promise was uh, daily inspiration. It's not to change your life or, or um, uh, totally turn around everything that you're your bad day, but it was about just making that moment better by, by a, a smile and the way that we, the, 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 the brand interacted with you in, in all the different ways. And so when Starbucks, when we did this uh, red cups on cars, when you left your, your, we glued cups on top of cars and taxis. And if you said, hey, you left your, your uh, coffee on your car, it would, you, would, you would get a free Starbucks card. And so that's a great example of that one-on-one -on -one interaction with the brand. So it's not mass advertising, but through that, you know, millions of, uh, uh, of impressions. And then probably the best example is when, when we made uh, the wrong drink for a man in a blue truck in Riverside, California. It was a white chocolate mocha. And, and so we remade it for him and gave it to him for free. Said, sorry, you know, we made you the wrong drink the first time. He said, oh, you didn't have to do that. Well, let me buy a drink for the truck, for the car behind me. And so he did that and then each of those cars did it for the seven uh, cars behind them. And, and so we were inspired by that, same as the Lego example and the Nike example, learning from our customers. And so we created these kindness cards where, where it says, our customers inspire us da daily. Please accept a complimentary drink. If you're inspired as we are, you can pass it along to a friend or even person in the line behind you. And to the gentleman in the blue truck, wherever you are, thanks. And then we tell the little story inside. So great example. Um, a few years ago in New York City, for 12 hours, customers bought um, drinks for the, the person behind them. So you think of the kind of environment that Starbucks was able to create through, um, uh, through having this story that was much bigger than coffee. And then you're able to, I just have to throw this up because I love this. You should go on the Oracle of Starbucks and you type in your, your drink name. So mine's a, mine's a tall soy chai and then uh, and then it says your, your personality type is a hippie, you're a hypochondriac health nut, and you're a sucker, you think you're so intelligent, well-formed, you've dabbled in Wicca, Wicca or pseudo-religions and changed your sexual orientation a few times this year. You probably live in California. Everyone drinks tall soy chai. Latte should be forced to eat a McDonald's bacon cheeseburger. So, uh, but you know when, you're just like any, any great brand, when you've reached that that, um, that level where people make fun of you and you're on the late night talk shows and that's, that's when you're part of the culture and you're, you're about more than just your, your product or your service. And then I, uh, uh, about four and a half years ago, I decided to step off and, and uh, start my own company and I started Tether in Pioneer Square and this is our first place and we've moved three times in the same block. Um, we're across the street from it right now. But uh, when I first started, it's like I, I wanted to do everything that I've ever dreamed of doing. So art gallery, retail store, uh, design agency. So, so that's what we did. we did. We did all those things. We had shows every month and we had uh, participated in the art walk. Um, and then uh, we had uh, events there and now this is our, our new space that, that we've recently moved into. And, and what we have now is, is really a place where we have a 3D printer sitting next to a letterpress printer. And we have that full, full spectrum from industrial design to, to uh, interactive design to uh, branding and videos and uh, writing. Letterpress is important in, in that it gets you off the computer and it makes you think in a physical space as opposed to kind of a theoretical digital space. You 
just think differently about what you're doing. And you bring that different thinking back into your digital layouts as well. And just the, the history that's involved in it too. It's something that's pretty amazing. You can get an amazing amount of texture and, and effects with the imperfections that end up happening within each of your prints that, that makes each piece unique. You can print one bold, beautiful color at a time. That's it. I love how you can take something old and make something completely new out of it, or apply new techniques to something that's old. There are definitely a lot of faster, cheaper, more uniform ways to print, but it doesn't make it better. They just don't have heart. So the, uh, the excitement of uh, one minute working on a computer with pixels uh, to getting uh, ink under your fingernails and, and working, on, um, working on a letterpress project. So also I thought, you know, as, as communicators, as designers, what, what we do is we, we create these stories. And I thought, you know, I've been doing this for 20 years. I, I know how to do it. And I thought, why, why, can't we, why can't we do some of our own brands? And so, so another uh, naive notion. Um, so when I, when I started uh, Tether, um, we started some of our own brands as well. And I think part of it comes from, like when I was an actor, when I moved to LA, I thought, oh, geez, I'm 100% dependent on others for work right now, casting directors and producers. So I started a theater, the Rita Hayworth Theater at Sunset Gower Studios to create work for me and my friends. I charge actors to come and audition for casting directors and put on plays. And then when I moved to New York, I started a production company because, again, I was uh, dependent on others for work. And, and, I, and I found when I went to Nike, I started Nike Entertainment. I did that after hours. Uh, I saw a need that uh, Nike wasn't touching consumers our, some of our consumers in, in all the different uh, touch points. And so every place I've gone, I've had this little entrepreneurial streak that I didn't really think about, but I just kind of did it because I was a little bit ignorant of what I should or shouldn't do. Um, so same thing with this. Uh, we started, uh, Tatcha was one of the brands, started this with a partner that I worked with at, at Starbucks. And, and it's, a, it's a beautiful brand because it has a story. It's, uh, we, the first product that we launched is a, a blotting paper. Um, for the T-zone here, and uh, it, it's, uh, the, it's the backing paper, the, the, the blotting paper is the backing paper for the gold leaf making process, and so it's a, it's a former waste paper, you know, they, when they pound gold into the shin si uh, thin sheets, it was the backing paper, so um, we tell the story how the geisha have been using it for 400 years is their secret, and the little village outside Kyoto where we source it, and then we've launched a, a whole line of uh, beauty products, and we've done it almost exclusively online and you know within six months it was on the Today Show and editors picking all the beauty magazines. That's because we targeted brand fans, we targeted beauty, beauty bloggers and um, celebrity makeup artists and we're able to build a buzz through that and, and they had a story to tell with it. It wasn't just a great product but it had a, a beautiful story behind it. Um, just like one of my favorite is the, one of the products um, is with the powder is created with rice bran, and rice bran is uh, is used in the uh, sake making process, and by the toji of the sake makers. And we we saw that they were grizzled old men, but their hands were like you know young boys' hands, and it's because of the rice bran they work in all day. So we tell that story. So it's a uh, um, it fires up the imagination. And here's another brand that um, that we're working on, and it, and again I thought this at first I thought this was a, a food company but then realize that it's much more than that. And we created this, um, uh, this mantra for this brand, and it's eat good, feel good, do good. And I have a little uh, video here that's showing the, uh, the, the next version of the website that we're working on right now, where it is about what you put in your body. Um, and because you take care of yourself, you're able to feel good and all the things that go around that, exercise and everything else, and then um, and do good is about your community and, and how you treat others. And so we've got this amazing response. We have a, a couple a restaurant and another one opening up in California, and then the product will be uh, throughout the United States in January. It's in uh, California right now. But the response that we've gotten from people, because it's about much more than food, and we're providing food that's uh, low in sodium and low in calories, but it tastes great, and it's uh, gluten-free and all these different things that a lot of people are looking for. So, again, another example how if you have a great story, 
And then, you know, when we, when we go into a community, it's more than just opening up a store. We're, we're becoming part of their community, and we're, um, we're, we're, we're planting these um, gardens, and so we're, we're there on an ongoing basis with them. This was a, this is a idea in progress, and, and, this, and this came from, from uh, me laying, this, trying to sleep at midnight and wondering what someone in Helsinki or Tokyo was doing at that same time. Um, it was actually started when I was flying back from uh, Asia once and how you get, you arrive in the U.S. But before you even left. And I thought, you know, you got to be able to manipulate the currency market somehow with this thing. But um, then I started thinking creatively about it and uh, I'm thinking, you know, when I'm asleep, someone else is creating. And when they're asleep, you know, I, I'm creating. And, and so how can we create some kind of some kind of community where, where we can all share at all times and you you know because you've, you've experienced that if you've worked with clients that are in a different far different time zone you go to bed or when they go to bed you're working and then when they wake up they have something in their inbox that, that you've created so so this uh, Tilo Taylor idea is that is that everyone can go on and they can contribute creative ideas in, in different buckets and so you'd have a You'd have someone from uh, Iceland contributing um, images, and someone from China uh, contributing illustrations and words from Australia, et cetera, et cetera. And then you're able to go in, and if, if you want to be creative but you're not particularly adept, then you can just do a, um, a, a random mashup that will, each time it's unique. And then other times, uh, if you, if you want to uh, manipulate things, then you're able to gather assets together and manipulate them and post them, and people can take those and, and riff off of those. So, okay, great, that's a fun idea, but then, you know, what, what can you do with that idea? Well, out of all these ideas, you know, you're going to have all this unique content. And so from that unique content, you can start creating products that, that come from that. Um, and they're one of a kind from, from the community. So in the, okay, more in the mercenary category, um, we're, we're, we've done all the work for Gatorade for the last few years. And um, Gatorade, again, is, uh, you know, they, they, they started off with one product. For 45 years, they were a hydration company. They were started by a, a coach and a, and, a, and a trainer. And they... Um, you know, they're trying to keep their players from fainting on the field, so they added sodium and um, the electrolytes as we know them today. And so uh, Gatorade came to us and wanted us to expand beyond that one product and how can we um, broaden the brand because there's much more than just that hydration product now. So this was before we started working with them, it was really about flavor innovation that's within that one product. And so we wanted to create, um, so we helped them create the G series, which was kind of the before you work out, while you work out, and after you work out, the, the protein you need afterwards and the carbs you need beforehand, and then the electrolytes while you're working out. And, and we wanted to create a language that could be consistent through everything. So we looked at, we looked at the, uh, the past and we saw that everything had this lightning bolt in it. And Gatorade's known already for the swagger. You see the television commercials. And so we decided to pair the science with the swagger. And the, so the science is about the lightning bolt. And we, we took that language and we, uh, and we also took the athletic stance, so all, all, the, all the product has that, you know, wide shoulders and slim waist. And, and we use that lightning bolt as a, as a visible uh, window into the science of the product. And then create um, products beyond the, the hydration um, that go across all the different uh, consumers' touch points. Of course, we added the ergonomic dunk handle at the bottom of the... Uh, of the cooler so that before they were like straining their backs, you know, so they're able to uh, dunk their coaches better. And then uh, I just thought I'd show you a, a, a full story of how we, how we created Gatorade.
So for uh, Gatorade, we're able to move beyond just uh, a hydration beverage to fuel for your body. Um, is the bigger platform for the brand now where they have products, whether things that you ingest or, or equipment that you interact with or services that, that you use. Um, so a brand is a non-linear ongoing story that needs to continue, continually evolve from its base in order to remain relevant. And you look at great brands that have done that over the years and those that have you can't all of a sudden be making washing machines one day and then ma making shoes the next day. I mean, it has to, you know, a great brand that, you've, the, that we've seen that has evolved in that way is um, Corning is a great brand. Um, you know, Corning Glass, how they used to make dishware, and now they're making uh, fiber optics and Gorilla Glass. And so it's still from their core and, and, and where they came from. Um, um, so the story is comprised of not only what the brand generates, but what the brand fans, um, fans of the brand generate for that brand, as I showed you in some of the examples. And I did this presentation a few years ago where I decided not to show anything that we had ever created for those brands, but it would only show what the reflection back. So I did screen grabs uh, um, from the web of, of what people were saying about the brand, what they had done with the things that we had created and morphed them into something else. It was very interesting. It's like kind of like Googling yourself and, and seeing um, who you really are, not who you think you are. Uh, I just went to a um, pop tech conference a few weeks ago, and there, um, one of the speakers, Juan Enriquez, talked about how um, it used to be that you get a tattoo and then it dies with you. But he talked about permanent tattoos, which are, are is our the, the, the digital story that is out there about us. You know, after we're gone, you know that that digital tattoo will be out there, and and you can say all you want about who you are, but that's really who you will be in, in the future. Um, so, uh, um, so the uh, reflection back from others, you know, as as uh, whether it's you as a person or, or you as a brand is in the end who, who we really are and, and um, you know, should be our goal. And I think right now as uh, creatives, um, strategists, we have, we have an incredible opportunity with all the tools that are out there for us because we, we create the story and then we have all these tools out there that will help us tell that story in many different channels now. It's no longer um, uh, that one-to-many or one-to-one -one like it used to be. We have all the social media tools and everything to, to help us tell that story. Thank you. We have about uh, 10 minutes, I think, in the, as the official timing. If, if uh, you'd like to do any questions, I'm happy to do those. Uh, if not, we can, we can break early. Anybody have any questions about my checkered past, about brands that I've worked with? Uh, yes. What's left that you want to accomplish? Uh, what's left that I want to accomplish is um, really uh, when I started this Tether, this creative company, I thought I wanted to create a creative playground where you can create anything that you can imagine. So that's the magic of what, what creatives are able to do where you take it. A, a blank piece of paper, white piece of paper, uh, no, nothing there, and then you create something out of it that, that is tangible, that you can experience, that you can sell, that you can interact with, that you can walk into, all the different things. So I can't think of anything else I'd rather do than, than continue doing that. And I think what's exciting is what keeps it fresh is all the new tools that are given to us um, yearly, daily, um, through all the innovation and technology that's happening right now. So that's really, I, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm a trained actor, and that's all I know. Knew, that's all I was knew how to do, and I, and I think this is a, you know, we have such a, a incredible platform now to, to tell those stories, and we're not limited anymore um, by, you know, by by money or by um, uh, uh, by audience or anything. So it's a lot of noise out there. But if you, I, I found that, you know. Uh, a few years ago, when I first started Tether, I went to visit a lot of the um, venture capital firms down in Silicon Valley, and um, a lot of them had some interest in, because they had all these little startups, and, um, and, but they didn't quite know what to do with someone like me. And, um, 
it took them a few years to catch up. And, and now, um, as you know, a lot of you all are doing that, this with uh, little startups. And now we're working with a lot of little startups who, who uh, have a great idea, but they, they need to create a story so that they can be distinctive and stand out. Because it's, you, know, you either have to be first to market, or you have to be the best, or you have to be, have the most. Um, you, know, you, have to, you have to be um, um, either Walmart, or you have to be, have a better idea um, over here and be more compelling. So, um, I think people are starting to see that it really, the story really does matter because uh, there's, there's no end of good ideas out there now. Anybody else have a question? Yeah. Yeah? Can you talk a little bit about the role of research in the brand development work that you've done and how you use research? Yeah. Um, I came from the Nike School of Research, which is similar to the Steve Jobs School of Research, which, you know, it's not the consumer's know, job to know what they want. Um, and that was a lot about what, how Nike operated. So it, it really has been more about validation because um, to give the consumer what they don't even know what they need yet, which they're excited to receive many times, um, that takes being really in touch with the consumer and the market, of course, um, but not in the typical way. I, I find that as we're working with some big brands even now, you know, they want to just you know, test, the, test something over and over again with you know, traditional focus groups. And when you show someone something um, here, they're going to compare it to what they're familiar with. So they're going to they're gonna compare it to how much it has changed to something that they already know. So they're not able to really make that leap to something over here. So, you know, validation is, is always good. Make sure that it is something that, you know, people would like or, or use. But asking them what we should do, asking them permission, uh, no great brand has been successful doing that. Yeah. I was just going to ask, can you tell us your favorite story about starting? My favorite story about starting Tether, well, it really is about, um, it's like every, uh, when I worked inside the, the brands, um, I was always a brand ambassador. So I was a Nike ambassador, a Lego ambassador, a Starbucks ambassador. So whenever I got up on a stage, or I met someone in an airport, or some, somebody cool, I was always speaking on behalf of the brand. You know, you can never turn it off, that's who you are. I accepted that. Um, but uh, I think the, the coolest thing about starting Tether is kind of getting the band back together. I, I met all these incredible people over the years. It's like, I wish I could work with them, but they're either a competitor or, you know, we're in the right field or something like that. So it's been able to find all these incredible people and gather them together in one place and, and then work on a, on, you know, that, a wide, you know, we, we have clients, everything from a, a, a digital wallet company to the, you know, the makeup, you know, a beauty company. So food company. So, you know, such a wide spectrum. So I think that's my most favorite thing. It's this little Petri dish of ideas and, and they all just, you can watch them spring to life and the, and the whole thing about starting some of your own brands or this is another model that we do is, uh, you know, we have big clients, you know, uh, you know, retainer clients and then we have, um, we have uh, project based clients and then we have um, several clients that are startups and they don't have a lot of money. So we believe in what they're doing like Life Kitchen is one of those. And so there are equity clients. We have an equity, a stake in the company in exchange for either no fee or low fee. And so we believe in them enough to take a chance. And if they do well, you know, then we'll do well someday down the road three years from now or, or something. And then, um, so it's exciting to have that um, flexibility. Yeah, I mean, uh, online, how to build something like Starbucks, the 100 Club, and how do you do it um, online? Um, it, uh, you know, the, the days of, uh, as everyone here knows, um, uh, the days of building a great website and enticing everyone to go to your website are, are kind of over. That's, that's one of the tools uh, that you have, but there's so many other places. Uh, where the consumers live and they want to take you with them. They want to take that brand and put it in their pocket on their devices and um, take it to Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and um, everywhere else that, that where they snack on, on, on brands. So um, 
so a lot of brands, you know, fall into that trap of one size fits all, and you know, here's something that will just split out, you know, for everything. So it's, it's, uh, you know, knowing your channels and and creating content that's that's appropriate for them um, in those in those different channels. So I, it's it, and it, but it all has to come from this core, um, you know, this story. So I I do this little these little charts that I do for brands, and I say, okay, this is where you started, right here, like. It seems like every great brand goes through the same cycle. It's like, you know, we make shoes, and then all of a sudden they're, you know, they're out here they're, they're making movies or something. So, uh, so then, then the consumer is like, what? And they're, you know, they kind of stop buying, and they go, oh, yeah, so who are we? And they go back in the archives and try to figure out, why did we start this company in the first place? And so all brands go through this cycle. I don't know why, but they, they get greedy or something. And... Um, so it's about you know creating that you know that circle. This is who we are, and then any ring that goes out from that circle has to tie back to that. So same thing you know online. Where what what is your story? What is your core story you're trying to tell? What is that compelling? What's your elevator pitch when someone says who are you as a brand, or what are you able to tell them that that gets them excited? And then and then uh, versioning that for all the appropriate different channels, that, um, digital channels that that you're that you're working in. Bounce? Yeah. There's much difference between storytelling for the B2C situation versus a B2B situation. Yeah, the difference between storytelling on B2C and B2B, business to consumer and business to business. Um, I get, you know, I think about that a lot because haven't you know I've done we've done some B2B but mostly B2C stuff and but no I, I don't think there's much difference because. If you're, you know, if you're a company and you're trying to get your suppliers excited about something, you still have to have that compelling story. You know, if it's a dealer or whoever it is that you're trying to get excited, you have to create that same compelling story that they're going to be able to pass on to their customer and so that you're both successful. So I, I, I think it's uh, very much the same. Yeah. Still people, I mean. Still people, yeah, on, on all sides. Yeah. Yep. So when did you first really brand and you understood what that was and that you wanted to actually work in that space. Like when was that moment where you're like, oh, this is something that I really want to do? Uh-huh. Uh, you know, when did I first hear the word brand and want to be a brand guy? Um, well, you know, I, I really, uh, it, I, I have this career path that's very, uh, it's somewhat unique and because when I interview people, they usually go to school and study whatever there is that they're, well, I'm hiring them for. But I didn't, and I you know, had that acting, musician, all that uh, author type of background. So I actually did fall into a job at Nike. They 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 offered me a job, and and they said um, uh, they said we want you to come work in our design group. And I said, doing what? And they go, well, you know, all the stuff you do. You're eclectic, and you have all these ideas. And so I don't. I don't, and this was 1989 before they had computers there. So I, I showed up and I, I said, well, it sounds fun. You know, if I'm going to work for a company, Nike is a pretty cool company. So, um, so I just learned everything on the job. I didn't know the difference between an industrial designer, graphic designer. Uh, the internet hadn't been invented yet, so there was no um, interactive designer yet. And so, um, but when I just started out of my ignorance, I, I just started dabbling and I, you know, I did it, I did all those things. I, you know, I played around in all the different design disciplines and then when computers came, learned that and learned the programs and, and delved into that, that area. So I didn't, I didn't have any pre preconceived, I grew up in Kentucky, you know, it was like retail, you know, wasteland. Um, and, and so I, I didn't know really what a brand was. I, I didn't, at least I didn't, hadn't internalized anything about a brand. And, um, we didn't have a McDonald's in, in, uh, in the town I grew up in. So, um, so it really was about through ignorance and learning, I guess, or, organically what a, what a brand was. And, and it really was whenever I found something that was compelling, it had a story. Same, it was a great movie. It's a great uh, you know, product that has a story around it. Those are the things that always attracted me. And, 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 and it, like even clothes, when I... When I when I started discovering the wonders of, of clothes, and I, again, I didn't have many options, but when I started finding out about designers and I found out the, the story of how they made that, or artists, the story of how they made that, and all of a sudden I had this appreciation for that thing and I wanted that thing because of the story, not, not as much because, because that, you know, the, the thing is the what, 
but it was the why that I was always interested in. And I, I think it comes back to, you know, as an actor, you have the, the text and the subtext. You know, you have, this is who, who they are, but, but you know, really who they, who, um, it's who they insinuate themselves to be instead of, you know, the words that they say. That was a long-winded answer. Anybody else have a question? Okay. All right. Thank you.